over to Randall Ray taking the opposition. Okay, first, uh, we're not going to have time to go through the history in detail. I think much of this is uh, fantasy history. Uh, money has actually always been a debt. The um, authorities have always played a role in developing the monetary system. <clears throat> the money of account has um, always been chosen by authorities. Now, authorities may be despotic. They also may be democratic. Um, so it, there's just too much there. Uh, the way that I see money is as uh, first and foremost, a unit of account. Uh, when a new nation is adopted, the first thing that they do is choose a money of account. Uh, the government issues the currency. Uh, there are very few exceptions throughout history. If we go back in time, 4,000, 6,000 years, or go around the world today, in almost every case, uh, the government chooses the money of account and issues the currency denominated in that money of account and imposes obligations in that money of account. So this is what we call a sovereign currency, and this is the basis of all the monetary systems that we know of going back to Babylonian times. <clears throat> um, the, uh, it's true that there have been occasions in which governments have pegged their currency to gold. Uh, today, we see some countries that peg their domestic currencies to a foreign currency, often to the US dollar, but it could also be to the Euro. Um, and in those particular cases, it is true that their currencies are redeemable for the thing that they have pegged to, gold or US dollars in the case of, let's say, Ecuador. Uh, we see this as an aberration. Uh, it is an exception to the rule. And it is usually a disaster. Uh, the gold standard that he was talking about that we had in place in the 19th century, uh, and Bob noted that we sort of begin and end uh, the gold standard uh, era with the same price level. But what he left out is there was great variability over the course of time of the price level. Prices collapsed in depressions. The whole 1870s was a depression decade. The whole 1890s was a depression uh, decade. Prices collapsed and then they rose rapidly when we were not in depression. So it's true, if you look at the endpoints, it looks like, hey, prices were stable. They weren't stable at all. Okay. Uh, we had a crisis in 1907. And that uh, led to the impetus to create a central bank. We call it the Fed in the United States. The United States was way behind, hundreds of years behind the creation of central banks. And we actually had uh, the most volatile uh, history of banking uh, in comparison to the countries that had central banks. So central banks can help stabilize. Now, I am very critical of the Fed. The, the, the Fed has continually failed us. So I agree with that 100%. <clears throat> um, the Fed failed us in the 1930s. The uh, Fed uh, failed us in 2007. We went into the global financial crisis. I think the Fed continues to make bad uh, policy decisions ever since 2007. So I'm not a big defender of the Fed, however, I, I would prefer to have a central bank uh, tie their hands much, uh, uh, in a much more constraining manner. And I think that uh, Bob would agree with that. Um, I would take away most of their responsibilities. Um, but that doesn't mean that I believe that we can get by with a purely private financial system. Uh, what underlies our financial system in the United States is the US dollar. And uh, the, uh, our constitution gives to Congress the sole power to issue the currency. And um, it underlies the financial system. Um, most of our financial system, uh, probably 99.9% .9 of our financial system is already basically private, for-profit, 
uh, operating uh, to earn profits for the institutions that issue the vast uh, uh, majority of um, our money supply. Now, a large part of that is backed by the full faith and credit of the US government. And uh, probably Bob and I would agree that a lot of this backing uh, leads to uh, uh, excessive risk, risk taking. And so I think that we should probably also peel back some of that. Um, the, in every crisis, the Fed backstops more and more of the private financial system, which encourages risk taking uh, behavior and creating new kinds of financial liabilities that are uh, seen to be very liquid until we have a crisis. And then the whole thing collapse. The Fed bails it out and rinse and repeat. And we go back to doing what we were doing before. So I think that we do have serious problems with our financial system, but they are not because we have a system based on the US dollar. Uh, I don't, I haven't been keeping track of my time. Uh, so let me just finish with um, what <clears throat> MMT says, because in this pandemic, uh, suddenly everyone, almost everybody, not the Austrians, but aside from the Austrians, almost everybody embraced MMT. And it, the, the turnaround was just unbelievable uh, fast. So if we go back to February, every uh, politician, Congress, every central banker around the world had to weigh in against MMT. Oh, MMT is crazy. We would never do what they uh, supposedly are telling us to do. Then the pandemic hits. And all of them say, we're gonna adopt MMT now. What is MMT? MMT is fly helicopters around and drop money everywhere. So we got the Trump checks. Everybody goes out to the mailbox, they pull a check out of the uh, mailbox. This is MMT. Well, it's not MMT. <laughs> we did not recommend that. We did not think it was a good idea. I still don't think it was a good idea. Uh, MMT explains how the monetary system actually works. And this should be useful even for Austrians. I once wrote a blog saying MMT is for Austrians too. Uh, we want you to understand how the monetary system works. We don't agree with your, um, your politics, but if you want to reform the, the monetary system um, and you can get the political support for the policies that you want, you ought to at least understand how the monetary system works so that you can use it in your interest. Now, I hope you don't succeed. Uh, I hope that uh, progressive democracy will eventually win out and that we will elect a Congress and a, a president uh, that is progressive and that wants to pursue the public interest. Um, and uh, we'll use MMT to inform their policymaking. So that would be my preference, but I think everyone ought to understand uh, how the economy actually works. So what MMT actually says is that a sovereign government cannot run out of its own money, uh, that it can afford to buy anything that is for sale. Our danger is that the government might try to spend too much. So we do worry about that. I know Bob worries about that. Austrians worry about that. Uh, that has been fundamental to uh, our analysis from the very beginning. We worry about inflation. And we just argue that what we need to do is be very careful. Um, and in spite of the claim that, you know, if Congress really understood MMT, hey, we can't run out of money, then what Congress would do is immediately spend without limit. But I've talked to a number of Congress people over the years, over the past 30 years, meeting with them, explaining how MMT works. And many of them actually do get it. They say, no, we can't say that in public, but we understand what you're saying. Uh, none of them wants inflation. I've never met any Congress person, Democrat or Republican, who wants inflation. 
they understand that that would be the problem. And so this idea that, you know, we need to lie to our politicians, we need to lie to the voters, because if they knew the truth, the government can't run out of money, they would spend without limit. So, uh, I just don't believe that story. I haven't met a single congressperson who wants to do that. Okay, I know my time is up. I'll stop.